All right, let's get started. Um, so today, uh, I wanted to give you a heads up. I am not going to be here next Friday. I'm not going to be here next Monday, okay? Um, I have two different trips that are all sort of happening at the same time. Did somebody write on the screen? Yeah. 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 Dr. Yeah. Dr. That's for taking two vacations, right? What's that? For taking two vacations, right? No, I can tell you that. Um, what what is it? But what is this word? I don't know. I just went out there. Is it? All right. Um, so just a heads up. I've already pre-recorded lectures for the next two lectures, and they're on the YouTube playlist. They're set to sort of go live uh, on Friday and Monday. Um, you are going to have some homework assignments due, but if you understand the lecture today, um, I think you're going to find these homework assignments to be pretty easy and these topics to be pretty easy. They're very rote and very sort of plug and chug concepts. I, I, I don't think it's going to be very difficult. Um, but what we're going to do today is we are going to start to uh, integrate ourselves into the actual um, uh, 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 Nuts and bolts of seal design, as were, no pun intended. And we're going to begin our um, uh, course with the first uh, main module of design, which is that of tension members. Okay, so um, I'm going to set the stage a little bit for analyzing a tension member, and then we're going to have some examples that we're going to do today. We're going to open the manual. We're going to get into it. So I, I'm, I'm really sort of I'm really excited to get into this. So the main topic of today is to compute areas and that seems pretty dry but it definitely will get you um, uh, oriented to how steel design works. Steel design is a very detail oriented science so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today are a lot of the fine uh, nitty gritty details. To begin I want to make sure that we're all on the same page um, regarding limit states, regarding the concepts of what we're doing so um, remember, uh, I introduced this term on day one, but I've been referencing it a good bit, so now we're going to bring it up again. That's the idea of a limit state. So a limit state is a condition that we as the engineering community define. Uh, and it is a condition such that if we violate that condition, if the loads exceed the resistance for that state, then we as the uh, community say that that uh, element or system no longer fulfills the relevant design criteria. And like I said, we generally deal with strength limit states and service limit states. Today, I'm going to introduce you to some strength limit states. Okay. Now, um, what we're doing uh, today and for the next few lectures, really for about the next three weeks, are we are focusing on elements that are kind of like this. Okay. So I have a bar and I yank on it. Okay. And the other word, and, and what we're trying to do is the first thing is given a bar. How much load can it withstand before it fails? And then the follow-up question is, given a load, design a bar, design a tension member to resist that load. So that, that's really sort of the goal of what we're going to be doing uh, in this component uh, of the class. Now, I'm going to break it back to mechanics of deformable bodies, engineering 216. If I have a member and I apply axial tension to it, right? The stress on that member is sigma equals P over A, right? The load per unit area. I have got to believe that everybody at least has a basic understanding of that. Am I correct? Right? So what I could do is I could flip that around and I could say if I have some limiting stress, I could basically say that the maximum load is some limiting stress times some area, right? That should be pretty basic, right? So um, most of our limit state expressions for tension members are going to take this form. They're going to take that some maximum allowable load is going to equal some limiting stress times some area. That's basically how it's going to work. Now there's going to be some details uh, integrated into that, things like LRFP resistance factors, things like how to compute the area, how much of that area is effective in transferring stress. but in a nutshell, that's basically how it's going to work. Okay. Now, so here's a tension member. Okay. This is a little bit more of a realistic schematic of a tension member, but I have some piece of steel and I'm yanking on it. Okay. Now, there is no, you know, structural engineering monster that's out there grabbing members and yanking on it. Instead, this member is integrated into a system that is experiencing loads 
And this particular element is experiencing tension. A good example of what I'm talking about is a truss, right? So I have a truss, I take that truss and I apply loads to it, I can compute reactions, do method of joints, method of sections, what have you, and I get that element in the truss is experiencing tension. So here's sort of what it looks like. I have the element, I have these bolt holes over here that are connecting that element to the next adjacent component, maybe some gusset plate or an adjacent member or what have you, and that element is experiencing tensile load because whatever it's connected to is pulling on it, right? Some force P, you know, 200 kips, 300 kips, whatever. Make sense? Now, you know me, uh, uh, my secret weapon is a samurai sword or a lightsaber if I happen to be a sci-fi fan during you know, some given day. And so you, you know I like to use that uh, to cut sections, okay? Um, when we're looking at a tension member, we have two primary sections that we tend to focus on, okay? We have names for those. The first is the gross section, and the second is the net section. So the gross section, a, a general definition for that, is basically just the main body of the member. Any, anywhere in the main body of the member that is away from the connected regions. Okay? So we consider that the gross section of the membrane. So we are going to have a limit state related to the stresses in the gross section, just as we are going to have another limit state related to the stresses in the net section. Okay? So the net section would be the section that is you know, through the connectors. Okay? Now, a couple notes just to make sure that we're sort of all on the same page. Notice how I'm only looking at the connection to the right, uh, and that's because they're the same. Okay? More often than not, in structural engineering, we like to keep things sim simple, i.e. symmetric. So if this connection is the same as this one, you don't need to evaluate both. Just look at that one. Okay? And 999 times out of 1,000, that's going to be the case. So the connection on one side is going to be the same schematic as on the other side, because we really don't like to make things complicated unless it's un uh, unavoidable. <clears throat> now, the important section that we're going to be considering is this section on the front. Okay? And we have a particular name for that. We say that the, 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 the section that we are important or, or that we are considering is the section that passes through the lead line of bolts. Okay? Now the lead line of bolts is basically the ones that imagine you were standing on this tension member and you had a flashlight and you were pointing that flashlight to this side of the connection, which bolts would it hit? It would hit the ones up front. Does that make sense? So the idea is that if I'm yanking on this tension member and it's going to fracture, it's going to fracture in half, it's going to fracture along the lead line. Okay. So just to make sure that that point is, is explained well, uh, in a later <coughs> lecture, which is one of the ones that I pre-recorded, um, I make a point about looking at connections like this with staggered bolt arrangements. And in a staggered bolt arrangement, again, the only ones that we're worried about are the ones along the lead line. So if I'm standing here shooting a flashlight, which bolts are, is it going to hit? It's the ones in the front. Does that make sense? Either the front over here or the ones over here. So far so good? Does it reverse for compression? No. All right. That's a good question. So compression is a whole nother animal in general, right? We're going to have a completely separate discussion on compression because the, the limit states are going to be all sorts of different. The short answer is yes, right? But it'll be easier to have those discussions when we get into connecting elements and columns. So let's, we'll hold off on that for now. Yes? This slide that you had in publications, that's not in the notes on Blackboard. It's on lecture five. I haven't gotten there yet. Okay, sorry. You're skipping but I, I'm glad that you're, you're following along. I appreciate that. But yeah, I talk about that during one of the pre-recorded lectures in Lecture 5. And I'm going to try and mention some of that a little later, so if we have time. <clears throat> All right. So far, so good? Okay. Now, I want everybody that brought their AISC 15th Edition Steel Construction Manual class to open it up to Chapter D. So we are opening up the spec. We are in table, or we are in 16.1-28. Okay. This is going to be our first real foray into the specification. So if you look at the top, you know, so we're in section 16, we're going to be in uh, chapter D, so it should be 16.1, and it should be uh, page 28. I 
Just everybody brought the mango. I love it. All right. So this is some snapshots that I took out of Chapter D uh, uh, of the manual, but everybody's looking at Chapter D uh, in front of you. So if you look at the very first line of the chapter, it says, you know, this chapter is organized into the following sections. The first section is on slenderness limitations. We are going to talk about that a little bit later. I'm going to skip over that for now, but we are going to handle slenderness limits uh, in Lecture 6. That's one of the pre-recorded lectures, so we'll, we'll skip that for now. But now let's get into section D2, the, uh, the tensile strength, okay? So what you'll see here in the spec is that it says the design tensile strength and the allowable strength of the members shall be the lower of the value, uh, uh, the lower value obtained according to these two limit states. So for yield, so for the growth section, we limit the stresses in the growth section to the yield stress to Fy. Okay. So the nominal capacity would be the yield stress times that area of the growth section. Now, the way the spec is organized is this is the nominal capacity. You then either multiply by this if you're using LRFD or divide by this if you're using ASD. We are using LRFD in this class. So we are going to be using this you know, expression. So if you wanted the design capacity of a tension member according to gross section yielding, it is 0 0.9 FY AG. That's it, right? Pretty simple, right? So if you're, if I give you a tension member, all you need is the area of that member and whatever material it's made from, and you can compute the gross section capacity very easily, right? Now, for the next section, we are allowed to exceed the stresses a little higher. We go all the way up to the ultimate tensile stress, the FU value. Hopefully, after the last homework assignment, looking up some of these stresses seems a little bit more comfortable. Based on the grade of steel, we can look up the FY and FU value and use those uh, accordingly. Now, for tensile rupture in the next section, or fracture, you'll hear me use the term fracture and rupture interchangeably. Um, the capacity is limited to FU times this term AE, the effective net area. Okay. Now, what is the effective net area? Well, keep on reading. Go to pay, uh, section D3, and it says the effective net area is equal to the net area adjusted by this term U, which is a shear lag factor. Okay. So ultimately what you should see is that the so number one hopefully these equations don't look very complicated they're they're not the math is pretty easy um, but you could probably start to guess that there are a few pieces that we kind of need to chip away at so today's lecture and really the next lecture are really only going to be focused on trying to compute the gross area and the net area. That's what we're interested in. It's just those terms. And we're going to fully explore those terms. And then one of the following lectures, we focus on U. And then the following lecture, we focus on slenderness. So the idea is that we take each one of these pieces one at a time, and then we start uh, uh, jumping right into it. Okay? So <clears throat> let's talk about gross area and net area. Okay? Because that's really going to be our first focus to make sure that we understand these two concepts. Okay? Now, Going back to my schematic that I showed earlier, so let me go to the schematic I showed earlier. Okay, so here's the schematic. We have the gross area and we have the net area. Now, first off, I have got to believe that everybody can look at this and go, the net area is smaller, right? Right? Because here's the main body of the member, here's the net area. That cross-sectional area has got to be smaller than this one. Why? It's got holes in it, right? There's holes drilled in it, right? So if you want a simple definition, a conceptual definition, how do you relate the gross area and the net area? Well, for bolted connections, in general, the net area equals the gross area minus the area lost due to the presence of bolt holes, right? And that is a very simple definition, or you know, simplistic. I'm going to refine that definition over the next couple lectures. But in general, you know, that, that's kind of what we're after, okay? We, we're going to develop a more specific formula for this later. But for now, we need to look at three things, okay? The first thing that we need to look is, is at is the gross area, okay? Now, the gross area, we're either going to compute the gross area or we're going to have to look it up, depending upon the type of problem that we're looking at. The second thing that we're going to need is the thickness of the plate through whatever the bolts are going through. So that also might need to be something that you look up, and we'll 
did some practice on that here a little bit today. Um, and the third thing that we need to consider is the diameter, right? We have the bolt diameter. Well, if we know the bolt diameter, what is the hole diameter? So, when we're computing area, uh, when we're doing net area computations, we use an effective hole diameter. So let me explain. Here's a bolt on a screen. The bolt has some bolt diameter, D sub B, okay? The first thing that you have to recognize is that the hole is actually physically bigger, okay? So if you have a half inch diameter bolt, the hole is not a half inch in diameter. It is bigger than a half inch. Anybody who's in the garage, if you have a half inch diameter bolt and a hole that is exactly drilled half inches in diameter, try and stick that bolt through the hole. It ain't gonna work, right? You have to actually drill the hole a little bit larger to accommodate the construction. We call that erection tolerance, to basically allow the structure to be uh, erected and constructed. And for standard holes in structural engineering, the hole diameter is a sixteenth of an inch larger. Okay, that's for standard size holes. There are uh, instances where oversized holes or slotted holes might be necessary, and in those instances, that's going to change. But for most standard size holes, the hole is a sixteenth of an inch uh, larger. And one of the things you're going to start to notice here in my presentations is the stuff in green. Okay. So, for example, this slide, um, you can see we add a sixteenth of an inch for erection tolerance. Where did I get that? I got it from section J3.2 on page 16.1-128. So, I don't want you to think that I'm just coming up with this stuff just off the top of my head. This is referenced based on standard practice and specification. Now, we're going to spend an awful lot of time looking at Chapter J later. Right now, we're just using a couple provisions from it. But Chapter J is the chapter on connections. But we're going to spend an awful uh, lot of time in Chapter J later. Yes, sir? Uh, is the whole diameter, uh, is this talking about like a bolt going through something? It's like nothing on the other side, not like it's like threaded into something? No, no. We're, yeah, so, so the hole is not threaded. Okay, gotcha. Yes, yes. We're talking about just the plate with a... A smooth hole, as it were. No, no threads cutting inside the hole. That, in that case, yeah, you obviously would be tighter tolerance. So, well, I was going to say if it was threaded, then I was going to ask, what was the sixteenth thing? Yeah, that, the thread or outside the thread. Yeah, you're right, and and we're not we're not worried about that here. So that's a good question, though. Now, we uh, what we do for tension members of is so to, so to get from the bolt to the physical dimensions of the hole, we add a sixteenth of an inch. But we also add another sixteenth of an inch to account for damaged material. If you've ever drilled a, a hole through a steel plate, take a look at it. Like there's burrs, the, the surface is kind of rough. And so we as a structural engineering community ask, can we really count on that little lip of material to transfer stress to the rest of the member? And we come away with that with the answer being no. So what we're going to do for tension members is if I give you the diameter of the bolt to get the effective diameter of the hole, you're going to add an eighth of an inch. Okay, So that's going to be something that you kind of need to either jot down or start remembering. Don't worry, we're going to have some practice on that here in a bit. But we're going to add an eighth of an inch to the bolt diameter to get the effective hole diameter. Does that make sense? Let's get into it. So I've got two examples today. I want to compute the gross and net area of two members. I've got a plate and I've got a rolled shape. We're going to do each of these together. Okay. This is not difficult. There is one catch that we're going to talk about here in a bit, but we'll get to that here in a second. All right, so let's start off with our first problem, okay? So our first problem is we're going to compute the net area for the plate shown, okay? Now let's make sure that we have a good understanding of what we're looking at here on the screen, okay? So first off, we have that the plate is 8 inches long. We have that the plate is 3 eighths of an inch thick. So the thickness is in and out of the screen, okay? Now we have... Um, we have three-quarter inch diameter bolts uh, in the plate. Um, now, I'll go ahead and tell you, for, for structural bolts, 
Three quarters of an inch in diameter is about the most common structural bolt diameter you will see used in the United States. Really the three most common that we use are three quarters, seven eighths, and one inch. Um, by and large, 90 to 95% of your structural applications, you can get by with um, those three bolt diameters for just about any job that you would need to do. Now, um, just to make sure that everybody was paying attention, is the lead line of bolts this line or this line? The one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the right. If you ever see me draw this symbol right here, this weird zigzag looking thing, this is called a brake line. And all that means is that the main body of the member continues over here. So if you're trying to think of the lead line, stand here, shine the flashlight. These are the bolts that you're going to hit. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Now let's do some calculations. All right. So first off, remember... Actually, let's write it like this. The area loss due to bolts. That's that's our governing equation. Okay. So let's let's take a. Uh, Let's take it one step at a time. Let's start off with the gross area. Can anybody look at this problem and see if they can tell me what is the gross area of this plate? <clears throat> so we, we know the width of this plate, and we know that it's 3 eighths of an inch thick. So how, how do you think we'd compute the gross area? Yeah, it, it's not that complicated. Yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. So, yeah, you're exactly right. So, it's just the width times the thickness, or 8 inches times 3 eighths of an inch. I think I can do that one in my head because the eighths cancel, and that's going to be 3 square inches. I, that should be pretty easy. Okay. So far, so good? Now... Let's look at the hole diameter, okay? So the effective hole diameter. So if I know that the bolt diameter is 3 quarters of an inch, to make sure everybody was paying attention, how do I compute the effective hole diameter? I add one eighth, exactly. So dB... Three quarters plus an eight, seven eighths of an inch. Not too shabby, right? Pretty easy. All right. Now, let's use a little bit of common sense here. Remember, my secret weapon of structural engineering is the samurai sword or the lightsaber if I happen to be a sci fi fan. So, if I am samurai sorting or lightsabering through this member, and I'm particularly cutting through the net section, how many holes am I cutting through? Am I cutting through eight holes? No, I'm cutting through two, right? So when I samurai sword or lightsaber, I'm only cutting through two holes, okay? So first off, if I want to compute the net area, I'll be consistent. So the net area should be the gross area minus two whole areas, right? Okay. Now, here's the question. What is the area of a hole? Uh, 
Uh, you're 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 on the right track. You're Potty squared over four. Okay, a lot of people are thinking potty squared over four, right? Nope, that's wrong. Okay, and you're like, wait a minute, that's the area of a circle. Yeah, it's the area of a circle, but it doesn't work here. Okay, what you got to think is you got to embrace the samurai sword or lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan. Okay, keep in mind, here's our plate, right? Let's look at it isometrically. Okay. So if here's my plate, okay, and imagine here's the holes going through that plate, etc. I'm cutting right here and right here. I'm cutting where those holes are. So if I look at the cross section right here, this is the area that I'm removing. Not a circle, but along that cross section, I'm removing that. And what is that area? It is the thickness times what? The diameter. So in this case, the area of the hole is AG minus 2, the diameter of the hole, times the thickness. It's not pi d squared over 4 because I'm not looking at the top and looking at the circle. I'm samurai or lightsabering through the section, and I'm looking at the cross section. And what do I see removed from the cross section? the diameter times the thickness. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? That's important. So, in this case, it's going to be 3 square inches minus 2, 7 eighths of an inch, and how thick was the plate? 3 eighths. So, what do we get for this? You forgot, you got to break out your Casio FX115 ES Plus or similar scientific calculator because you got to do that in here too. Do you keep it in fractions? Or? No, no, decimals. Let's do decimals. And, and I'm going to talk about that here in a second. Got 2.34. 2.34. Do I have a second on that? Yep. And what are the units for that? It's an area. Squares. too bad, is it? Pretty easy. Steel design isn't that hard, I, I promise you. Yes? Um, why do you only include like two of the holes? So does like, the net area consist of just where you're cutting the section? Just where I'm cutting the section. Okay. Yes. It, so think about it. If I'm yanking it like this, then the cross-sectional area is the area okay. cutting like that. Yeah. So if I'm considering the gross section and the net section, the area along that net section is subtracting those two bolts. So, what would it be for cutting halfway through the circle? My question. Wait, what? So you're cutting halfway through the circle. Why would it be half of that area? Half of where's the half? The, the circle's still completely gone. Okay. Let me see if I can draw my schematic a little better. Like, I, so what I'm saying is. here, right? So the hole went like that, right? But you're cutting right through the middle of the hole, right? So, like, let's just look at a single plate with a hole in it, right? I'm cutting like that, right through the middle of it, right? So along this cross section, that's what's missing. Does that make sense? That's the material that's gone, right? Because if I actually look at the plate right here, here's what it's going to look like. Actually, hold on. Right, so the plate is going to sort of like go like this. Right, and then the plate's going to go like that, right? And so the net area in this instance is that blue region there. Like that's the net area, right? And how do I compute the net area? It is the gross area minus whatever this rectangle is. 
And I'm asking you, what is the area of that rectangle? It is the diameter times the thickness. Does that make sense? So the cut is like that, <coughs> that thread portion. That's what's being removed from the section. That makes sense. Everybody else okay with that? Sound good? Okay. Now what we're going to do, I'm going to ramp it up a little bit. Now I want to compute the area of this. I want to compute the area of a W10 by 49. Okay. So we have a W10 by 49. I have sort of an isometric view right here. Okay. So you can see I've got bolts going through the flanges, right? So if we're talking about in the direction of loading, I've got five per line, but along the lead line, it's not going to be that many, but we'll get to that here in a second. So this is my little connection scenario here, my little isometric view, okay? And again, we have the same governing principle here, right? We have the net area, the net area equals the gross area minus the area of the holes, right? Right, that, that's our governing principle, really. So my question then is, the first thing that we probably need to do is get the gross area. What is the gross area of a W10 by 49? You look it up in the AISC 15th edition steel construction manual that everybody brought to class. So what is the gross area of a W10 by 49. We're going to make sure everybody finds it. What was the gross area again? Somebody said it. Square inches. Okay. Now, something that I kind of like to see on our assignments, and, and this is really more for your benefit than it is for mine, is so the gross area is 14.4. Okay. Now you did not just grab that number out of thin air. You found that in table 1-1 on page 1-28. Okay. Now um, at a minimum, you probably should include call-out references for the data that you're pulling from the manual. You probably, like, I'm not going to get worried if you don't include the page number, but at least the table number. I think you need to do that because it'll help you remember as you're studying for, you know, celebrations or later assignments or whatnot, where did you get that value? It came from this, okay? All right, so we got the gross area. It's 14.4 square inches. Was anybody not able to find it? Don't hesitate. That's okay. Like, Everybody able to get it? It looks like everybody's at the right spot, right spot, right spot. Looks like everybody is in about the right section of the manual. Yep. Okay, good. Keep it there because we're going to need to get something else here in a second, but I just want to make sure everybody's able to find it. Okay. Now, if we're going to compute the net area, the net area we do need, um, we need to look at the bolts, right? So for the bolts, So I'm already introducing you to some shorthand. So EFF for effective and then DIA for diameter. So we know that the bolt diameter <coughs> is three quarters of an inch. So what does that tell us about the hole diameter? The effective hole diameter, I should say. If the bolt diameter is three quarters, what's the effective hole diameter? Seven, seven, seven eight. Eight. Okay, all right. Okay. Now, before we start going down the rabbit hole with calculations, are we going to need any other data for this section? Yes, sir. What are we going to need? Thickness. The thickness of what? Flange. The flange. There we go. We need this term right here because that's where the bolts are going through. Now, what is the, the symbol in the spec for that dimension? Say it again. 
Not TW, T sub F. Right? The, this one right here, that's TW right here. So yeah, so this one's TW, that one's TF. Yeah, so we need the thickness of the flange. What is the flange thickness? So we'll say flange thickness. Flange. What is the flange thickness for a um, W10 by 49? Alright, did you say 9 sixteenths? Yeah. Okay, take your hand. Zero point five six. We use design dimensions, not detailing dimensions. I guarantee you there's probably still somebody in here that will will use detailing dimensions on a homework assignment. And I will find them, and I will take my finger, and I will go. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah, so the idea is that if you're preparing engineering drawings or you're pulling tapes in the machine shop, like pulling tape measure, you could, you're probably going to pull 9 sixteenths. But the actual decimal value is what we're using for design. So we're using 0 0.56. Okay, now, the in order to compute the net area... <coughs> we need the gross area and then we subtract the area lost due to the presence of bolt holes. Now, taking a look at this schematic and breaking out the samurai sword or uh, lightsaber, if I'm cutting through the net section, how many holes am I going to be chopping through? Four, right? Because if I samurai sword back here, I've got one, two, three, and then there's four back there. So the gross area minus four holes, which is going to be 14.4 inches squared minus four times seven eighths of an inch times 0 0.560 inches what are we getting for the net area? And we'll say two decimal places, and then I'm going to talk about precision here in a bit. Twelve point four four. Do I have a second? Good. I want to talk about stagger, but um, first off, does everybody everybody good on this so far? Pretty easy, right? I mean, isn't that complicated? Okay. Now, one thing I'll say about precision. So you're very rarely going to see me do a lot of steel design calculations in fractional form for this very reason, right? When you look up properties for W27 by 84s or L6 by 6 by 3 quarters or whatever, all the data is listed in a decimal format in, in the spec. So you're, you're really hardly ever going to see me write uh, uh, do calculations in fractional format. As for precision, you'll probably see me on the board doing things to like three decimal places. Um, I do that just so that like as we're having a discussion in class, we all know that we're able to, we're all able to see where the values come from. But really two decimal places, that's good enough. And, and you're going to see when we start getting into design, there's a little bit of conservatism built into your design just by the way that we select shapes. So I'm not saying that you can get super fast and loose with your rounding, but you can go to like two decimal places and you're largely going to be fine. But three, if you're feeling uh, like you want to be more precise, but no more than three. So. Sound good? Okay. All right. So first off, before we talk a little bit about stagger, I do want to make sure that I show you at least this first homework assignment that's coming up. So in case there was uh, still a few students that um, that were waiting on a manual, okay, so you're, I'm going to ask that you compute the net area of two rolled shapes, and I went ahead and gave you the associated data from the manual. This is going to be the last time that I do that, in case, just in case people were still waiting on the manual. 
but I want the net area of this shape and the net area of this shape. With this shape, just make sure that you recognize that you've got bolts going through the flange and the web. So you got to make sure you do your bookkeeping correctly for that. Make sense? I think this is a really short assignment, so I don't think it's too big of a deal. Sound good? All right, since I'm going to miss um, Friday and Monday, I want to talk a little bit about stagger. Because I talk about it in the video, but I want to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page with how you handle stagger. Okay. So um, first off, would you agree that at least right now, that could be an acceptable, more scientific formula for net area, right? That the net area equals the gross area minus the holes, in which case the holes are the diameter of the hole times the thickness. That's essentially what we're doing, right? Now, this formula is fine, but it's incomplete, okay? And it's incomplete because this formula really only works for parallel bolt patterns. And what I mean by that are bolt arrangements where the, the, the bolts are in a grid-like arrangement, okay? So to put that, uh, to give you a visual understanding, that formula only works for this, okay, for these types of bolt arrangements. But it is very possible that we have bolt arrangements like this. These are what I mean when I say you have a staggered bolt arrangement. Now, the first question to ask is, why in the heck would you do that? Like, why would you make your bolt pattern weird? Why not keep it simple? Why not keep it grid-like? The simplest answer is it increases the net area, right? So, for example, if I am trying to, so if I'm trying to samurai sword or lightsaber through this section, which has a bigger area, that line or that line? Which has a bigger area? If I were to samurai sword and then look at the area of the cross section, which has a bigger area, the straight line or the diagonal line? The diagonal line, right? So the short answer is why would you ever stagger your connection? It's to increase the net area, right? Because if I'm looking at, let's say, this, um, this bolt pattern here on the, uh, let's say I'm looking at this bolt pattern here on the bottom right. A potential failure path might be something like this, all the bolts along the lead line. Those diagonal paths serve to increase the net area. Now think about what happens, right? What happens if I increase the area? If the limiting stress taste stays the same and I'm increasing the area, what am I doing? I'm increasing the capacity, right? So suddenly I've made that member stronger by just arranging the bolts in a different fashion, right? So there is a very real reason why you would do that, so that a structural engineer can use the same member and get more capacity out of it, right? There's a very real uh, uh, connotation as to why you would do that. So I, 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 again, this class is very real world. We don't just do things just to make them complicated. All right, now, whenever you're dealing with the staggered bolt arrangement, there are two things that you have to consider. There are two added complications. The first is, how do we account for the increase in area, right? Because there is an increase in area, all right? How do, and also, how do we account for multiple failure paths? And what I mean by multiple failure paths is, so if I'm looking at this connection, there are multiple different ways that it could fail, okay? For example, this is a very possible failure path. Another possible failure path <coughs> Is that one. Another one is that one, right? There are multiple different ways that the section could fail, okay? So that is an added complication. And so we handle these one at a time. I'll show you how we handle them one at a time. Now, the first question is, so let, let's talk about identifying possible bolt paths. So if I have, I want to make sure I'm not running over. Okay, we're good. All right, so if we have um, a given connection and we want to identify potential bolt paths, what we do is, the first thing that we'll do is we'll introduce some notation. So a lot of structural engineers will do something like this. Like they'll say, okay, we'll call this A, call this B, this bolt C, this bolt D, this bolt D, this F, this G, just so that we can all speak the same language in terms of identifying potential paths, right? 
The next thing that we do is we identify all of the possible failure paths such that if we were to cut the plate in half along that, um, along that, that path, that it would literally separate the path in half and it would keep all the bolts intact. And the way that we keep all the bolts intact is we just limit our paths to the lead line. So let me give you an example. A, a potential failure path is path BDG, which would be this path right here. Sorry, I meant for that to go through the center of the hole. And I can't draw, so it didn't go through the center of the hole, but it's supposed to. So if I were to, I mean, imagine taking a pair of scissors and literally cutting the plate here and cutting the plate here. That would literally separate the plate in half, right? It would separate the plate in half, and all of the bolts would remain intact because I'm focused on the lead line. That is a potential failure path. Can anybody identify another potential failure path? We'll write that down. B, C, G. Can anybody add yes? Could it be A, C, E, F, like another straight line? So, okay, A, C, E, F. Okay, so we're going to talk about that, that plate or that path here in a second. I'm going to say that that one isn't a, a, a lead line. The reason why, well, let's, let's talk about it. Okay, so so let's say let's say that we had that path. Let's say we had path A C E F. Right. Let's just say we had that. So you take a pair of scissors. So imagine taking a pair of scissors. Imagine this is a sheet of paper and cutting here, cutting here, cutting here. Can you take this sheet of paper and just freely move it over? We're shaking your head no why. Because this bolt's still going to pin it down, right? Yeah. So this would not be along the lead line because you'd have to shear this bolt in half to move that plate over. Does that make sense? So that's not on the lead line. Somebody give me another path that is on the lead line. Would you have something like ACDEF then? ACDEF. You're 100% right. So ACDEF. That is a lead line path, right? So, a lead, so that lead line path would go like this, 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 and like that, right? Would that separate the plate in half and allow it to freely translate? Yes. Okay. Now, how would we compute the net area of this path? Well, I'll tell you how we would compute it. We would take the gross area, we would subtract three bolt holes, but then what we would end up doing, and I'm going to show you the formula here in a second, is we add two stagger factors. And stagger factors are account for the increase in area along the diagonal path. I'll show you what a stagger factor is here in a second. But for every diagonal increment, we add a, 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 a stagger factor. Can anybody identify any other potential failure paths on this? I'm just curious. B, C, D, E, G. Okay, so that, that's a good question. So, so what about A, C, D, E, G, right? Now let me ask you a question. <clears throat> All right. Imagine you have a piece of taffy in your hand, and you're yanking that taffy this way until it fails. Okay, is that piece of taffy going to fail like that, or is it going to want to fail perpendicularly? So I guess my question is from a path of least resistance standpoint, why would the plate fail this way instead of failing this way? It's a, it's, it's a very common, like we, this always happens in steel. A lot of people, a lot of students say, why not B, C, D, E, F or something? Well, because there's no reason for the plate to go diagonally. The only reason it's going diagonally here is because it's going from hole to hole. And even from hole to hole, it's the shortest path possible. Yes? Couldn't you technically kind of argue from... E to G, there's like more material diagonally than there is E to F for it to fail. So, so think if you're loading it, when is it going to fail? It's going to fail under the lowest possible area, right? All right. So, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the pre-recorded lecture, but let me just say a couple things. So, the way that we handle those diagonal paths is we compute what's called a stagger factor, and it's really plug and chuck. So whenever you have a diagonal path, you just compute this term here, S squared T over 4G. And S is just, for any diagonal path, S is that spacing here, and G is that spacing there, right? So just like with, with parallel connections, 
Staggered connections, it's a lot of plug and chug. The only thing is, is that there are multiple potential paths, right? So just on that last connection, there were three or four different potential net areas. So how do you as the structural engineer handle it? You compute all of them. And then which one do you use? You use the smallest one, right? Because the smallest one represents the weakest, worst case scenario for the member. So that's the one you hang your hat on for the purposes of design. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay, so I've got a homework on that, but I go into that in much more detail in my pre-recorded lecture. The one on Monday, we talk about shear lag factors. And so when we come back on Wednesday, you'll have done some homework, but we're really going to get into it when we come back on Wednesday. If you need anything or have any questions on the homework for the next little bit, don't hesitate to email me, don't hesitate to message me on Teams, and I'll get back to you. Sound good? Y'all are getting... Uh, uh, some more time off from Dr. Mike. That's all I got, everybody. And I'm counting everybody present for the next couple of lectures, so uh, because you all didn't like opt to not be here, so I'm just going to count everybody present. So I will see you all next Wednesday. Did I have a code today? Yes. Oh, I'm good.